rate as John Ruffo was set to show up and serve his 17 year prison sentence in 1998 after being convicted on several fraud and money laundering charges he would hand in his ankle bracelet and go completely off the radar. But what got this man, John Ruffo, a spot on America's most wanted list? An elaborate business plan to develop smokeless cigarettes and putting his master manipulation skills into full effect. John Ruffo would go on to network and create fake proposals which was called Project Star, developing smokeless cigarettes in order to obtain money from the banks. He would accomplish this by working with a former employee from Philip Morris. Ruffo would go as far as forging documents and securing a hefty bag of money in the neighborhood of $350 million from bank loans and other sources of funding from that he and his network would use to speculate the stock market and purchase luxury items. John Ruffo, a man some would refer to as a master manipulator, someone who enjoyed being flashy or over the top, had just managed to avoid a 210 month prison sentence. Ruffo was not just known for his master manipulation skills, but also for his computer engineering and way of carrying business. Ruffo was born into a working class family in Brooklyn, managed to earn a degree in computer science. The year is 1993 and Ruffo has started his own business in Midtown Manhattan where they serviced and sold IBM computers. This is where Ruffo would meet his future partner in crime, Edward Reners. The former employee Edward was responsible for obtaining computers for the giant tobacco company Philip Morris. Ruffo and Edward wanted to play the stock market but did not have the money to do so. Yet, their plan was to go after the banks and obtain rather large loans and use that money to make a mint in the stock market with the intention of paying the banks back and keeping the profits to themselves. So Ruffo and Edward wasted no time. They went to an Italian restaurant in Manhattan and got right to work in formulating a plan to convince the banks and loaning them funds. The plan was formulated and it was time to put it to action. The pair would go on to convince banks that they were leading an international research program where they would need to fund staff at various offshore locations and would need computers to support this project as well. There was only one problem. They would need to make sure that the banks would not try to contact the tobacco giant Philip Morris themselves. How would they manage that? They did so by explaining that this research project was top secret. This is actually where they came up with the elaborate name Project Star. At their first meeting with the Signet Bank to propose their idea, Project Star, Edward required them to sign a confidentiality agreement that barred them from talking about the project with anyone including Philip Moores as well. This went well for Edward as he has worked with Signet Bank before because he already built up a history of doing business with Signet in the past while working for Philip Morris. There was just one catch. In order to complete the deal, the bank required what was called a incumbency certificate from Philip Morris, which would give Edward authority to conduct business on behalf of Philip Morris. The document also required a company seal and executive sign-off. Obtaining a corporate stamp was easy. Ruffo and Edward would find a place in Lower Manhattan that would do the job, no questions asked. But where would they get a signature from a company executive? Well, while the pair were in a taxi, listening to the radio station, they heard the radio host who was giving out prizes to certain numbers that called in. They decided to pose as a radio host and call Philip Moore's executive, informing her that she has won a free dinner at a rather luxurious Manhattan restaurant. The pair has found this employee through a list of company officers. As Diane McAdams fell victim to the pair and bought everything they said, she would agree to sign a release form and send it directly to them. It would take little time for the pair to receive the signature and have it sent to Signet Bank. Shortly after the wire transfer of $25 million would be sent to Ruffo's account. This in return would break open the floodgates for the two and the money would start pouring in. 
Over time, a total of seven banks would loan out more than 350 million without ever seeing any of these offshore locations or a computer. Edward would funnel his new gains into the stock market as well as a penthouse inside the Trump Tower. As for Ruffo, no one was really sure on exactly where his money was going. Ruffo's now ex-wife would explain how they were not living a millionaire lifestyle and just lived in a small detached home in Queens. It would not be long before this ship started to form some leaks. In 1996, a Japanese bank officer would grow suspicious of the certificate that Edward provided. The officer would go on to fax a copy of the certificate to McAdams and she would reply back the same day explaining that the certificate in fact was bogus. The bank, in a slight panic, would go on to question Edwards and propose a meeting with the financial executive and McAdams. Ruffo and Edward could feel the walls slowly starting to close in on them, and the only way out of this was to find someone who could pose as Diane McAdams. Ruffo would find one of his employees, a single mother from New Jersey named Jody Bachman. The pair would explain to her that they were involved in a secret government project attached to Philip Morris. Bachman still remembers when she received the call from Ruffo explaining the meeting with the bank. Edward and Jody met with the bank officers at Philip Morris just as they were getting ready to explain everything. The FBI would come in and make some arrests. When Ruffo was finally arrested in 1997 and charged on 160 counts of bank fraud and money laundering, his bond was set to $10 million. And for the single mother, Jody Bachman, her charges were later dropped. After Ruffo managed to convince six sets of family members into putting their homes up as collateral, he was out of jail. Ruffo would go on to plead guilty in 1998 and six months later, he would be sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. As the sentence was handed to Ruffo, officers of the court would in return start to put handcuffs on Ruffo and prepare to escort him to a waiting cell. His attorney would then speak up and explain that there is a deal in place for Ruffo to surrender himself. The judge questioned if this agreement was true and after verifying that it in fact was, Ruffo and his lawyer, Jeffrey Lichman, would have the handcuffs removed, walk out of the courtroom, and hop on a plane to New York. Ruffo had five weeks before he had to turn himself in to serve his prison sentence, and his wife would go on to say that everything seemed normal during this time frame. On November 9th, 1998, Ruffo would drop his wife off at a train station. This would be the last time she would ever see her husband again. Later that evening, she would receive a call from the FBI with agents on the other end of the line, screaming at her, where is John Ruffo? Her blood ran cold. After returning home, she would be greeted by a suicide note that wouldn't make sense to her or the FBI. The last known sighting of John Ruffo was at an ATM later that evening in Queens. After Ruffo decided to go ghost, he would leave a chain of bad events in his wake. All of the family members that put their homes up to help bail him out were now forced on to the streets. Most of them were in their 70s to 80s. Ruffo was now MIA and believed to have stashed away $8 million. To shine a light on what John Ruffo looks like, he's about 5'4 and 67 years old, weighing in at about 170 pounds and severely balding. Yeah. Most of his life, he has worn thick framed glasses that complemented his mustache. And an important note to add, his feet were rather short and wide. And it's actually rumored that he needed to have his shoes custom made. When a raid was executed at John Ruffo's office, while tearing apart cubicles and sifting through paperwork, agents would notice a photograph. In this photograph was John Ruffo, an assistant director of the FBI's New York office and their SWAT team. Apparently, the FBI neglected to share with US Marshals the fact that John Ruffo was an FBI informant, leaving some to believe that the reason Ruffo was able to avoid a 210 month prison sentence was actually with some help of the FBI itself. When the day came for John Ruffo to serve his lengthy prison sentence, Ruffo would rent a car which would not be found for some time. 
When the car was later located, it was found parked at a long-term parking lot at JFK International Airport. Ruffo would not just leave his entire life and a rented car behind him before fleeing, but also his now ex-wife Lyndon Lawson. While digging around Ruffo's ex-suites, his ex-wife would find a name and address back in Italy of Ruffo's old New York barber. The barber moved to a home off Italy's southeast coast a few years before Ruffo fled. Later, the barber was tracked down but denied seeing or even remembering who John Ruffo actually was. It is important to note that Ruffo wrote in his diaries about connections with a Soviet computer engineer. However, it's not clear if there was any further investigation into this lead. It is also important to note that Ruffo had connections in Aruba and ancestral ties in Italy. So, where is John Ruffo now? Well, if we knew, he most likely would not be on this podcast. But what about his last known location? Well, back in 2016, there was a man, actually Ruffo's cousin, who thought he saw John Ruffo at a Dodgers game sitting front row. After a 48-hour lawn investigation, it was deemed that it was not John Ruffo who was identified at the game. 